Hi, I'm Mike Gaben and welcome to episode 7 of my KSP career. We're going to be getting a, a bit of a variety of different uh, missions happening in this one. We've got an unmanned lunar orbit mission, but unlike the one from the previous episode, this one's going to have to be inserted into a specific orbit about the moon. Uh, we have two Kerbals that have yet to be in space, so one of those is going to end up riding our biggest rocket yet. But before we get to any of that, we do got to get started on our communication network. So this is ComSat 1. And one of the first things you might be noticing here is that I have SAS on. And that's because I have upgraded from the Stayputnik probe uh, body to the Probodyne Octoprobe body, which allows you to use SAS. So I'm, I'm not going to use the um, remote tech flight computer. I'm going to uh, fly this thing uh, manually. Uh, just to continue to show that I, I, I can't do it. I, I can do these things manually. Um, so, let's talk a little bit about the mission. The mission is to get this satellite into a circular orbit with a period of two hours. Now, the mission that is up there on the on the side there is, is actually a custom mission. Um, the Mission Controller 2 mod allows you to design, with some limitations, your own missions. Uh, and so you can design your own communication satellite missions. All you have to do is specify what period it is that you want. Uh, they also give you custom station keeping missions that you can, you can insert. Um, but obviously I have yet to make space stations, so those ones aren't into play. But, but this is great to, to, to be able, you know, i got to make communication satellites, so it's great to be able to generate my own missions that I can custom tweak to the way I want to put these satellites into orbit. Now, you might be wondering, so I'm the one that picked the two hours, so you might be wondering why why the two hours? Well, a two-hour period, first of all, I like two hours. It's, it's a nice number. I, 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 I thought, you know, the Kerbin's orbit is six hours, so two hours, I don't know, feels kind of nice rather than just some sort of random time. Now, the plan here is to put four equally spaced satellites into this orbit. And if you use a little bit of Pythagorean theorem, you can calculate that these satellites are going to be about 2,358 kilometers apart. Now, the Communitron 16 antenna has a range of 2,500 kilometers. So that, all these satellites, if placed properly, will all be within communication range of their neighboring satellites. So I can actually connect all these satellites together just using the Communitron 16. So that's why I kind of like this particular altitude of just a little over a thousand kilometers. All these satellites can only will be able to communicate with each other without having to get into directional antennas. In addition, if you can imagine a 2,500 kilometer wide, uh, radius circle around each of these satellites in their orbit of just over a thousand kilometers, you will realize that they will actually cover all the orbits, all the positions, pretty much inside that circle. So anything in, underneath an altitude of a thousand kilometers will be within range of one of these communitrons on one of these satellites. And so I find for my first generation group of communication satellites, uh, this works effectively well. And here we are at altitude finishing off our circularization burn. Uh, one of the things I like to do, because I really want to get that period to be exactly or as close as I can get to two hours, um, one of the things I like to do is when I get really close, I tweak down that engine to very, very little thrust so I can just do these little puffs to get the period to be within the accuracy of what we can measure it with Kerbal Engineer to be two hours. And that will really help when I have them all up there because they'll all you want them all to be as close to two hours as you can get so that they do not need a lot of um, further maintenance in order to keep them in the orbits that you want them to be in. Now I've shown these directional antennas before but I've been pointing them at specific things like mission control. I want to show what happens when you point them at, at actual planetary bodies. So I'm going to point this antenna at Minmus. And then what you can see is what you get here is this, it's actually a cone. 
you know, because it's three-dimensional, even though it looks two-dimensional here, you get this communication cone pointing out towards Minmus. And any satellite that is in that cone that has a suitable antenna to be able to pick up the signal will be able to communicate with ComSat-1 here. So these communication cones become very effective for communicating a wide range of satellites together. The other thing you can start to see is how these satellites are starting to communicate with each other through these communitrons. You can see these um, these uh, communication links that are starting to form between the satellites already. Now the one in the lower orbit in the white, or in the white orbit is JunkSat3. The one in the blue orbit is the one I'm on which is ComSat1. One and they're already beginning to communicate with each other. And in fact, if you take a look, you can see that ComSat three, if it goes a little bit further in its orbit, is about to lose its communication link with the uh, Kerbal Space Center. But that doesn't matter because there's a further link being relayed through ComSat one. And so this is how these satellites start to work together to effectively communicate, no matter where they are positioned. And here we are a few days later with ComSat 2. Now, having uh, been freed from the 30 part part limitation recently, I've been uh, pimping my rides a little bit, and one of the things I've been adding are these lovely blue lights. Now, these are omnidirectional lights that come from the B9 Aerospace mod, and uh, what I like to do is just kind of light up the inside because anyone who owns anything from a PC to a sports car knows that it becomes infinitely cooler once you've lit up the inside all in blue. But it wasn't long into the mission when I got this warning that uh, one of my batteries is just shorted out and this would be a result of the dang it mod. Now this is the first time this mod has reared its its little head um, and this mod simulates wear on various parts and as they become older and older they have a bit of a probability of failing and here well this battery that is now highlighted in red has failed on me now thankfully I actually have quite a lot of batteries on this particular satellite in fact I worked out how much battery power is going to need in order to survive the uh, Kerbin night so uh, it has a lot quite packed into it. I could ride this thing right through the night and uh, it would still have enough juice to keep all the antennas going. Except for now, of course, because this one battery has just gone dead on me. But uh, KSP, when you do not have the vehicle in focus, it doesn't actually drain any of the electricity. So this satellite will continue to function uh, pretty much normally, even with this dead battery. But uh, ah, maybe later on it'll give me a reason to send some Kerbals out there to do a little bit of a repair mission. Now the plan here was to put ComSat 2 in an orbit directly opposite to ComSat 1, but I can see as I'm closing in on Apoapsis that I am in fact a little bit behind of where I want to be. But that's not a problem. So what I need to do is actually just put the satellite into an orbit with a period that is a little bit less than two hours and then um, what will end up happening is I will slowly catch up and once I am directly opposite I can then circularize my burn and uh, everything will be good and here we are finishing off that burn and ending up with a period that is about 30 seconds under two hours. So now it's just a matter of waiting for uh, ComSat 2 to catch up and get into the position that I want it to be. And while we wait for that I now have enough funds to upgrade the administrative building which will allow me to take up to 60 percent of my reputation and allocate it to different areas and I'm going to do get into play this unpaid research program. And I'm going to devote 25% of my future reputation towards that. So from here on in, 25% of my reputation is going to be converted into science. So that should uh, help fill in that science tree just a little bit quicker. And after a little time warping, ComSat 2 is now closing into the position that I want, directly opposite from ComSat 1. Um, so this is looking pretty good to me. The other thing I want to do is also further uh, 
time warp to the point where the altitude of ComSat 2 is in around 1067 to 1068 kilometers because that's the final altitude I wanted in a, in a, in a circular orbit. So I'm just going to uh, get myself to the right altitude, burn a little bit prograde to get my period up to two hours to match that of ComSat 1, and then it's just a matter of burning radially to uh, get my apoapsis and periapsis to where I want them to be. And the thing to notice is as we uh, burn radially that the period really isn't changing. All you're doing is affecting the periapsis and apoapsis. So I'm, I'm, I'm just turning this slightly elliptical orbit into a much more circular orbit uh, just to make it look a little nicer. And with my communication network partly complete, I thought it'd be time to put it to the test. So this is JunkSat 5, and the mission is to put this satellite into a very specific orbit about the moon. Now, I'm not going to go into this steep ascent that I've been doing lately. I'm going to go into do a very normal ascent, getting into a low carbon orbit, and I'm going to be depending upon satellite relays in order to uh, continue my communication with mission control. Now one of the things I do have attached to this particular rocket are these Globe 1 SRVs which come from the KW Rocketry Pack. I do love the look at them and they're always entertaining when you detach. Just watch. I just love watching the aerodynamics model play on those SRVs. But anyway, we are now in a uh, standard low curve in orbit and we're going to plot a course to the moon using a maneuver node doing things the normal way. We're then going to select the moon and view from the moon and this is going to allow us to really tweak our approach towards the moon and the orbit that we're shooting for is this blue one and what you want to do is you want to come in you got to first of all pay attention which way around are we going around uh, the moon and this blue orbit is going around in a prograde direction so I want to come in on the east side which is the left side of the moon from this particular perspective and I want to just intersect uh, or come close to that orbit as far east of the moon as I can get. Uh, if I were if that orbit was going around the other way going around in a retrograde direction then I would be coming in on the moon on the other side on the west side of the moon. Now, you don't want to do any uh, burning normally or uh, radially at this point. You want to make this burn purely prograde. When you're this close to the planet and going this fast, uh, normal burns and radial burns are not as effective as they are when you're further out into space and going quite a bit slower. So we're going to do this burn this in two burns. We're going to do this initial prograde burn and then we're going to do a correction burn at a midway point. And here we are coming towards the end of our transit burn. Uh, I am using the flight computer just to lock myself onto the prograde vector but I am doing all the thrusting manually because I want to do this visually. Uh, this will allow me to really zero in and get that trajectory exactly where I want it to go. And the eagle eye among you might notice that I am actually burning retrograde at this point. That's because I overcooked my initial burn and I got to bring it back. It happens. And at this point I want to deploy the directional antenna. But instead of pointing it at mission control, which is what I've done in the past, I'm going to point it at Kerbin. And this will give me that communication cone so that the satellite will not only be able to communicate with the Kerbal Space Center when the Kerbal Space Center is on the right side of the planet, it will also be able to communicate with the communication satellites that I have set up as long as they are pointed in the right direction. And uh, here we are putting in our correction burn. The timing of the correction burn isn't that crucial. You can play around a bit with the time, but you'll probably notice that it doesn't make a huge difference on where you, you know, exactly where you perform the burn. This burn is going to be 
completely normal and completely radial. So the first thing I need notice is that I am coming in too high, so I have to do a little bit of anti-normal and then use the radial, um, a radial component to the burn to get the uh, my trajectory to just come in contact with the furthest eastern part of the orbit that I want. So we performed our correction burn, we time warped out and we are now in the moon's sphere of influence so we are inspecting to see how our trajectory is matching up with the orbit that we want and now it's time to insert another maneuver node and this maneuver node I want to be right where my trajectory contacts uh, the orbit that I'm interested in. And of course what I want to do now is perform a burn that will match the orbit that I want. And with my maneuver in play place it was time to check on communications and this is where things started to look a little bit sketchy. I could see that the Kerbal Space Center was on the western limb of the planet and soon to disappear behind Kerbin as uh, the planet rotated. So, and remember, I only have half a communication network set up, so communication could still be a little bit spotty. So I decided to use the flight computer, computer built into remote tech and use the node execute function. Um, the issue is, is it's a good idea when you're doing this to point the uh, satellite at the node before it executes the node. You'll see why in just a moment. But... When I did that, I began to notice that I was losing electrical power. And the reason was is because the node happens to be pointing pretty close to directly at the sun. So my solar panels were not in a very good position to generate electricity. And I was worried that if I time warped to the node at this in this attitude, that I will have lost all my electricity by the time I got there, and then it wouldn't be able to do anything, it wouldn't execute at all, and uh, I would end up losing, I wouldn't be able to get my capture burn, and then I would end up losing this satellite into space. And after time warping while watching my electricity charge very closely, I decided the risk was not worth it. So I turned it back to uh, a normal attitude, pointing uh, close to being straight north, and that uh, allowed the solar panels to have much better exposure to the sun which could charge up my batteries and it's a good thing I did that because not long after I lost my connection to the Kerbal Space Center and the communication outage remained right up until it was time to execute the burn now with the flight computer with remote tech if the command was entered in while you had a connection that command will still get executed even after the connection is lost so that's a good thing but the satellite is not oriented correctly so what is going to happen is the burn will start with the satellite pointed the wrong way and well you'll see what the result of that is Though not quite the mission plan, you can see I still did get my capture, so it was pretty easy to wait another orbit, set up another maneuver, and end up getting this orbit down to the mission parameters. And now it's on to our final mission of the video. Of our six Kerbinauts, two of them have yet to go into space. So it is now Robert's turn. Robert is uh, the second of our three scientists. If you might, you might recall that Robert did have a mission, a rather dull mission of running around the uh, runway, collecting some science there. So this one's going to be a little bit more exciting because Air, uh, Rod Bird is riding, uh, riding our heaviest rocket to date, weighing in at 40.3 tons. This is Aristosthenes 1. Aristosthenes 1, the mission is to get into a polar orbit so we can grab an EVA um, report over the one biome we have left, which is the uh, ice caps biome. And then also, 
we're going to push our apoapsis up over an altitude of 250 kilometers that will get us into a high orbit where we will be able to collect some more science. Now, a few things to note about this vessel. Number one, we have loaded it up with some science. We have two goo canisters, one for low orbit, one for high orbit. We have two of the materials bays as well. Again, one for low orbit, one for high orbit. Another thing that you might be noticing is that I uh, covered this thing up with some lights, one nice blinky white light that you might be noticing as well. Those lights are aviation lights. Uh, they come from a mod called Aviation Lights. So uh, that, I, I, I quite like them. I think my ships all lit up look uh, quite a bit better. Now as mentioned, we are going for a polar orbit. So we want our final inclination to be as close to 90 degrees as we can get it. Um, you don't want to point the craft just straight north and go. What you want to do is actually go a little bit west of north so that you'll be pulling that inclination towards you and then as the inclination closes in on 90 degrees you can start pointing your ship more towards the north so when you're right at 90 degrees then you're going straight north and then you'll have the inclination where you want it to be. And finally you might be noticing that I have SAS on and you might be going what? Isn't Rod Bird a scientist? How on earth you got SAS on? What kind of hack are you performing here? Well, it is no hack. What I have done is taken one of the Probodobodyne probes and buried it in there. So buried it amongst all the batteries and goo canisters and solar panels that are in the middle of that ship. There is a Probodyne core. And that means that we have some SAS, or another way of thinking of it, Robert really isn't flying this thing at all. He, he's got buttons to push, but, but they don't do anything. You know, we're, we can't trust him with this. Aristosthenes, of course, is the second ship that I have named after a historical figure, another Greek. And this particular Greek is best known for his calculation of the circumference of the Earth. More than 2,000 years ago, uh, using what is really a very easy to understand technique, he ended up calculating the distance around the Earth with a reasonable amount of accuracy. And there's even some evidence to suggest that he's not the first person to have made this calculation, but he is the first one that definitely has it recorded down. And uh, it's kind of ironic to think about the fact that 1700 years later, a gentleman by the name of Christopher Columbus thought Aristosthenes was full of baloney and thought, you know, this, this, this Greek guy, he doesn't know his math. I know math much better than him. I know that the circumference of the earth is actually much, much, much smaller and managed to convince other people that that was true. And of course, he was dead wrong. But he was a very lucky wrong man and happened to land into an unknown man a landmass uh, partway between on his trip to India. So, uh, yeah, sometimes you can be wrong and still be lucky. And we are now inserted in our polar orbit and coming over the ice cap, so it's time for Robert to come on out and do his thing. And immediately he realizes, boy, this is a lot more fun than running around on the runway. What have I been missing while my fellow Kerbinocks have been out doing all this kind of great stuff. So he collects his EVA over the ice cap, completing the last of our orbital EVAs that we need to collect. And the other mission he's got, the other thing he's got to do while he's out here is to collect the science from the materials bay and the goo canister that we have already uh, operated at this point. Uh, as per my usual plan, the whole service module is going to be deorbited and just burn up in the atmosphere, and only the command capsule is going to return. So we need to collect the science and store it all in the command capsule so that we can get it back down to Kerbin. And with our low orbit science mission done, it is time to do a little bit of a prograde burn and get our apoapsis up to just over 250 kilometers so we can collect ourselves some high orbit science. And with that 250 kilometer altitude achieved, it's time to collect the rest of our science. So we're going to open up the goo canister, we're going to open up the materials bay. Uh, Rodbird, of course, is going to go out there, do another EVA, collect uh, that science up. Got to remember as well to do a crew report. And uh, then it's time for us to head back down. 
the descent itself was pretty uneventful, but I did have this one uh, fun little hitch that ended up happening. As uh, you see me do in the past, what I do is I turn the ship upwards when I jettison the command module just as I'm entering into the atmosphere. But the only torque on this vessel is the uh, torque provided by the command capsule. I have no... Um, other reaction wheels on here so I couldn't keep it pointing up as even in this very very thin atmosphere so what I ended up doing was kinda of getting this thing spinning just a little bit so I could fire off the uh, command module out of my way so I didn't have to worry about hitting it and that created a fun little situation well after Rod Bird's head stopped spinning, he was able to recover his vessel and descend normally. And here he is coming down, landing in the grasslands. I'm actually on the peninsula that is towards the east of KSC. Given my orbit, and given that I couldn't get the trajectories mod uh, working just yet, I actually figured out what the problem was. I didn't have the most recent version of Near installed. Uh, I didn't think that was all too bad. And the other advantage I found right now with landing on the grasslands is since, since I had upgraded my science building, I now can take uh, surface samples. And finally, this is the ascent stage from Aristosthenes 1, and you've seen me uh, deorbit and recover these uh, spent stages before so this is not something too new except I do want to show you one thing and that is right at the very top you might be noticing some uh, deployed air brakes these air brakes are from the B9 aerospace mod and they are incredibly handy if you recall the last time I showed one of these things deorbiting it was tumbling and bumbling all over the place but notice how straight and true this one is going and that's because of those air brakes that are deployed up at the top which move the center of drag far higher so that the center of mass is now lower than the center of drag and like a dart it the mass is now the way I want it but towards the bottom of the vessel and so the most of the heat of re-entry is being taken by those engines rather than the fragile parachutes and this makes the descents far more reliable and the recoveries far more reliable. Anyway, that's going to be it for this episode and we'll see you next time.